In your A-level chemistry, there are lots of procedures and calculations that you need to learn to do, and you might find my videos about Hess's cycles useful for that. But there are also quite a few key facts to memorise, like the definitions that underpin those calculations. This video is the fourth in a revision series to help you to ensure that you've thoroughly learned the facts that are listed in your specification. There's a link in the description to all of the questions, so you can answer these and then use the video to check your answers. You should already know from your GCSE studies that exothermic chemical reactions are those that release energy to the surroundings. And the reason that they do this is because they release more energy by bond making than they absorb by bond breaking. Endothermic reactions are kind of the opposite of this. So they absorb energy from their surroundings because in their case, more energy is absorbed by bond breaking than is released by bond making. So again, these energy profile diagrams should be familiar to you from GCSE chemistry, but they can also be examined in the A-level exams as well. So in each instance, we have either progress of the reaction, or it might be described as time on the x-axis, and then the amount of energy that is stored in the chemical bonds on the y-axis. So for an exothermic reaction, which will ultimately give out energy to its surroundings, the reactants have more energy stored in their chemical bonds than the products do. And the difference between those two values is the amount of energy that is given out by that chemical reaction. Now, the amount of energy doesn't just consistently decrease. First of all, it needs to increase because before any bonds can be made, bonds need to be broken. And that's an endothermic process which is going to absorb energy. So initially, the graph is going to rise up to the transition state. Um, and that amount of energy that is required to be absorbed is going to be our activation energy. And then after that, bonds are made and energy is given out. And then in contrast to that, for an endothermic reaction, this is going to absorb more energy than it releases. And so the reactants have less energy stored in their chemical bonds than the products have stored in their chemical bonds. So on each one of these diagrams, we can label the activation energy. So that's the amount of energy that the um, chemicals need to have when they collide in order for that collision to be successful and a chemical reaction to take place. Um, and this is going to be labeled from the height of the reactants up to the peak, that point that we often call the transition state. And then the overall energy change is going to be the difference between the reactants and the products. So for an exothermic reaction, that arrow is going to go down. For an endothermic reaction, it's going to go up and we can label that as a delta H. And we can use the sign of delta H to tell us from a calculation whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. So, of course, for an exothermic reaction, you get a negative value and for an endothermic reaction, you get a positive value. An enthalpy change is a change in heat energy, which has been measured at pressure that doesn't change. It's measured in kilojoules per mole. And when we talk about standard conditions, we're usually talking about 298 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals or 100,000 pascals. And for some of the different enthalpy changes that we'll talk about, we're also going to need to specify that it applies to one mole of a substance. Now we can start looking at particular enthalpy changes. And if you're getting ready for the year 12 exams, then the two big ones that you need to be concerned with are combustion and formation. And people tend to trip up with these because they tend to just talk about standard conditions and leave it at that without adding in a particular extra key phrase. So when we talk about the standard enthalpy of combustion, we're talking about the enthalpy change when one mole of a substance is completely burned in oxygen. And we also need to specify that all reactants and all products are in their standard states. So it's not just enough for you to say under standard conditions. You need to specifically talk about the reactants and the products. When we talk about the standard enthalpy of formation, we mean the enthalpy change when one mole of a compound is formed from its constituent elements. So as you know, if it's an element, it doesn't have a standard enthalpy of formation. Or if we did talk about it having one, we would say that it was zero. And that does need to be under standard conditions. And again, we need to say that all reactants and products are in their standard states. Calorimetry is an experimental technique that we can use to work out what the change in heat energy is when, for instance, there's a state change. Most of the errors that are associated with this experiment are going to be because of heat losses to the surroundings. So we want to minimize those by completing a reaction in a polystyrene cup or by adding a lid. You're going to stir the reaction and the point of this is to homogenize your reaction mixture so that the energy change is equally distributed throughout the solution. And this is going to mean that you don't have a situation where all of the energy is being released very, very close to your thermometer and therefore you overestimate how much energy is released in total.
You should also take regular readings of the temperature before you start the experiment and then also afterwards. And this will allow you to extrapolate backwards and work out if we could pretend that those heat losses to the surroundings hadn't happened, then how large would the temperature change have been that we would have seen? There are, however, some things that you just can't take account for. One of these is the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter itself. So, for instance, if you're examining temperature changes associated with burning fuels and you use one of those little copper calorimeters, the copper is going to absorb some of that energy. And therefore, that's not going to be taken into account in your calculations. And there's really nothing you can do about that. The other thing that you really can't control for is the fact that if you're examining entropy changes of solution, the solution that you make will not have exactly the same specific heat capacity as water. So in all of the exam questions, they'll tell you to assume that the specific heat capacity is 4.18, but actually that's not accurate. And that's going to mean that your calculations are ever so slightly off. You can calculate the energy change for a reaction by multiplying together the mass of the substance that is changing temperature its specific heat capacity and the magnitude of the temperature change. We don't need the temperatures that we use to be in Kelvin because we're looking at temperature change. And so since the size of one degree C and one Kelvin are the same as each other, it doesn't matter if we're starting or finishing in a slightly different place. The difference between the start temperature and the end temperature will be the same whichever units we're using. Specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a unit mass of a substance by one degree C or one Kelvin. Most commonly that unit mass is a kilogram, so you could also define it in those terms, but technically you could do specific heat capacity in terms of the temperature change of a gram. So that's why we say a unit mass. The units for specific heat capacity are going to be joules per kilogram per Kelvin, or as we say, you could do it in terms of a gram of the substance, in which case it will be joules per gram per Kelvin. The first step in processing the data from a flame calorimetry experiment is going to be to work out how much energy in total has been released. And for that, we need the equation we just met. So Q is MC delta T, where M is the mass of the water, C is the specific heat capacity of the water, and T is the temperature change. The biggest mistake that people make here is thinking that M is going to be the mass of the fuel that was burned. But you have to remember at this point, we're trying to work out the energy change and it's the water that has changed temperature. So it's the mass of the water that we need. Now this calculation will give you an answer for the energy change in joules. And that's all good and fine. But when we work out the enthalpy change for burning the fuel, then we're going to need this to be in kilojoules per mole. So therefore we need our energy change to be in kilojoules too. So you divide by 1000 to put your answer in joules for Q into kilojoules. Now we need to know what the mass change of the fuel has been. So how much fuel has been burned? So you take the start mass of the fuel and subtract the end mass of the fuel to give the mass change. And the reason that we need this is so we can work out how many moles of the fuel have been burned, because right now we have an energy change, but it doesn't correspond to one mole of the fuel. So if you take the mass that has burned and divide this by the relative formula mass of the compound that was being burned, that will give you the number of moles that are used. So then delta H will be um, Q in kilojoules divided by the moles of that substance. When you do flame calorimetry, you're always going to underestimate the energy content of the fuel. And this is because of the massive heat losses to the surroundings or even just to the calorimeter. Even though you calculate that a certain amount of energy has been transferred to the water, there will also be lots and lots of energy that has been transferred to other places. There's also a very high likelihood that your fuel has been undergoing some incomplete combustion, which is not going to be as efficient and not going to release as much energy. It's important to remember that if you encounter a question in the exam that asks you to describe one of the required practicals, or for that matter, any experiment really, even though it's only worth six marks, these are level marked questions. And so that means that you don't get six marks for saying six true things. You get six marks for showing that you've reached level three. And in order to do that, you're going to need to include a huge amount of detail. So for every single step that you write, think, can I name a piece of equipment that's being used here? Can I explain why I'm using this technique? Can I explain why I'm doing things in a certain way? Our first step in order to measure the enthalpy change of solution is going to be to measure how much of the solute we're adding, because we can't work out an enthalpy change per mole if we don't know how many moles we've added. So they might give you a specific mass that they want you to use, but if they don't, then we're thinking somewhere in the region of a gram or a couple of grams, just to be realistic. So you measure that out on an accurate balance using a weighing bottle. And it's really important here that you're using the before and after weighing method. 
So you're going to weigh the weighing bottle with the solute in it and then tip the solute out and weigh the weighing bottle um, when it's empty. And it's really important that you're using that method and not the rinsing method that you might have chosen to use when you made up a standard solution. Because here we're measuring the enthalpy change when this solute gets wet, when it interacts with water. And so if you were rinsing it out, you would be prematurely starting that process. And so the value that you recorded for the enthalpy change later, when you intentionally added it to some water, would not be accurate because the process would already be underway. Then you're going to measure out an appropriate volume of water and you're not going to lose marks here if you say 50 and the mark scheme says 25, but it just needs to be a sensible volume. And of course we measure that with a measuring cylinder and then we're going to transfer that to our reaction vessel. So here it would be sensible to use a polystyrene cup with a lid because again we're trying to minimise those energy losses to the surroundings. We want as much of the heat that is released as possible to remain within that vessel so that we can um, accurately assess that using a thermometer. Now, using that accurate thermometer, I'm going to take the temperature of the water every minute for four minutes. It doesn't have to be exactly four, it could be three, it could be five, but the point is you're taking the temperature at regular intervals for several minutes before you add the solute to it. And the point of this is that you want an accurate initial temperature for your water. Basically, what you want to prove is that you haven't just had this water come out of a very, very cold tap, and actually it was already increasing in temperature without you doing anything by adding the solute. Then if we've measured the temperature up to four minutes at the fifth minute, so where we haven't measured the temperature, that's where you're going to add the solute. So then you're going to continue taking the temperature readings every one minute. So we've got a missing value at five minutes, but you've recorded from zero to four and then you've recorded from six onwards. You're then going to plot this data onto a graph. So we've got um, time along the x-axis and temperature along the y-axis. And we've got four readings from the start. And then we've also got um, uh, five minutes. That's where we've added our solute. So you're then going to draw two lines of best fit, one through those first four points and one through the latter points. And you're going to extrapolate those lines of best fit until they sort of not intersect, but until they both go through that five minute point, and you're going to calculate the change in temperature there. So the point of this is that the later points are showing us how much energy is being given to the room as that solution cools. And so we can sort of extrapolate back from that and say, if we could have made the temperature um, reading accurately at five minutes, what would it have been? So then we go back and we use that calculation, Q is MC delta T, and I would suggest that you do include this in your method, even though it's about data processing, not the actual experimental bit, because if we're trying to work out the enthalpy change of solution, we need the calculations in there. So that will give you the energy released in joules, and of course you need to convert that to kilojoules. And then we work out the amount added, in other words, the moles added, by doing mass divided by the relative formula mass of that solute, and then finally, we can work out that delta H will be the negative Q divided by moles. And it's going to be negative because we're looking at that temperature increase. And finally, we get to Hess's law. Now, most of what you need to be able to do with Hess's law for the exams is actually about drawing the diagrams and using those Hess's cycles in order to calculate enthalpy changes. And I have got a few videos to help with that. But there are also a couple of facts that you need to know. The first thing is a definition for Hess's law. So Hess's law tells us that the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction is independent of the route taken. So in other words, once you've drawn your Hess's cycle, it doesn't matter which way around you go. As long as you go from the same start point to the same end point, the enthalpy change will be the same. Mean bond enthalpy is a number that's produced by looking at lots of different compounds that all contain the same kind of covalent bond and working out how much energy is required to break one mole of that covalent bond on average. So the enthalpy change needed to break one mole of covalent bonds. In order to calculate the delta H value for a particular reaction, if all we have is mean bond enthalpies, then we need to add up the value of all of the bonds that are going to be broken and add up the value of all the bonds that are going to be made. And then we do the sum of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds made. When we do those mean bond enthalpy calculations, we often get a different answer to one that was determined using Hess's law because they are mean bond enthalpy calculations. And actually, the size of the enthalpy change for a particular bond is going to be slightly different in slightly different compounds.
Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found this video useful in your preparation for your A-level chemistry exams. If you did find it useful then don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry videos coming soon.